Thank you, Philip, and uh, thank you all for being here. Um, Australia has had three great housing crises. Um, the first of them was during the Victorian gold rushes, and it affected only Melbourne, Geelong, and to a small extent, uh, Sydney. And it was really resolved within about, within about two years, certainly completely resolved within about seven years. Um, the second was what we're really dealing with today, which was the post-World War II crisis. And whereas the first had been sorted out by private enterprise only, this uh, post-war one involved massive intervention by both Commonwealth government and state government as well. And it lasted really about 10 years. To me, the period after 1955 is a fairly ordinary period, and I'm going to barely touch on that uh, today. The third is the crisis we have today, which is now predicted by some experts to last for decades. Um, so I wonder what, what we've lost in the uh, intervening period and what we can learn from the previous solutions. Uh, I want to just mention the amount of prefabrication in Australia before World War II, because it continued into the post-war period in quite significant ways. Um, this is um, a, a Christmas card done for the Van Dyke brothers by George Molnar, the famous Sydney architect and cartoonist. And the Van Dyke brothers are really, in some senses, the heroes of um, prefabrication, not just pre-war, but also post-World War II. They were in Sydney. Um, they were ordinary house builders in Sydney from 1923 onwards. And then they took out a patent for the section and system of construction. Um, and they um, uh, then appeared at the Sydney Royal East Fair with a model house. And this is the second year, 1938, this uh, catalogue here. And remarkably, they were recognized by the International Journal, the American Journal Architectural Forum uh, in 1943 as being ahead of American prefabricators. They seem to be showing the ways of the world, which today is, of course, entirely, entirely forgotten. Um, and they devoted, this journal devoted four pages, four full pages to the section and system of the Van Dyke Brothers, uh, which is this. Now, there's one point about the system I want to point out to you now, which is important. Um, which is that the panels are connected by splines, those loose tongues um, in between the panels. That was a system unknown, so far as I can make out, in the world at that time. Um, there was a, a complete survey of European and North American housing systems by John Burchard in 1936. None of them had this, this feature. Uh, but it does appear later on in a way which I think is, is significant uh, in Australia. And it appears here in these... Um, Technical drawing is from the uh, Ormars Sagvex Aktibolag, um, Swedish house, which Scott Morrison is going to be talking about later on. Um, and in fact, the Van Dyke system is very similar. So this was taken up in the First World period, maybe not learned from them, but maybe just coincidence, but it's the same essential, essential system of, of construction. Uh, and by the end of World War II, there is at least a, a former munitions factory at Villawood in New South Wales, and we're producing houses on a massive scale for the New South Wales Housing Commission, the Water Board, the Warragamba Dam construction, and all sorts of other major projects. And they finally wound down in 1955. Having touched on the pre-war period, when they were the only significant house builders, the other prefabricators were Sidney Williams, who made iron buildings, um, I want to touch on the wartime period itself, which also has repercussions in the post-war period. Um, uh, numerous buildings were prefabricated for the uh, military forces during World War II. This is just an example of a building being moved. But you can see from this that the technology is not really very relevant to post-war housing. One factor, though, is the introduction of masonite. Masonite had just begun to be produced in Australia before the war, and it was used extensively in wartime buildings and then in the post-war period. I just point out the high technology of the Australian Armed Forces here. They brought this building on a horse and cart, and then they're moving to place by multiple uh, human um, labor. Now, the First World period, of course, was governed by the Ch Chifley government. Um, in 1944, Chifley made a major announcement on housing, which is while he was still the housing minister in the Curtin government, and then a series of events followed, which I'll just touch on. Here's what Chifley said in 1944. Cabinet takes the view that the housing shortage has now become so acute that relief on a limited scale is imperative if the civil life of the community is not to be disrupted, etc. So they saw it as a major social issue from that time. And they began to issue um, uh, these wartime housing bulletins. 
And then when the war finished, they were turned into this series of housing bulletins. And the point I want to make about this is these bulletins no, don't mention prefabrication. The word prefabrication does not appear in any of the wartime bulletins or any of the post-war bulletins which I've been able to examine. It was not on the horizon. So although there were prefabricators in operation, it was not seen in any way as a solution to the crisis. I should stress that as I go on, don't hesitate to chip in and correct me or comment because uh, that'll only help if you get rid of the discussion. Just stop me if, I, if I'm going too fast also. But the result of the war um, was, in, was multiple. First of all, there were buildings from the war period which were then brought into use. What people generally don't realize is um, that the Nissan hut, which was quite famous, was not used by the military forces in Australia during the war. They were all imported from Britain after the war. Um, the um, British forces returned them to Britain and private dealers uh, refurbished them and they were then exported to Australia and elsewhere. And numbers of these survive. I'll just mention at the moment, this illustration was produced by Tony Lee. Is Tony here? He's going to be here today. Yeah. Uh, Tony has done a remarkable thing. He's gone through building permit applications by local councils and drawn from them, often make his catalogues and or plans for these houses, many imported houses. Uh, and if somebody were to do that in every state, we would get a huge amount of new information. I'll use some of Tony's illustrations. I don't want to use too many because he ought to publish them himself. He's been very kind in giving them to me. But here are examples of the sort of thing you find surviving. The top one's in Nissen Hut, that's the British type, which would have been imported post-war. The bottom one is a Quonset hut, the American type, which would have been brought back to Australia probably from Manus Island, from which a number came. Now, of course, most of these were not used as houses, so they have only marginal relevance to our topic today. Uh, there's Quonset huts in detail uh, in, in New South Wales. Um, they were characterized by the use of the strand steel rib, which I can't clearly point out here, but it's an interesting technical development. Although they didn't get used as houses, they were used as accommodation. So here's British migrants wading through the mud of the Nissen huts at the Holmesland Migrant Hostel in, in Melbourne. The other legacy of the war was personnel who'd come to maturity during the war in this field. Kenneth Wiles was a manufacturer. Jay Payne was a, uh, a military um, work superintendent in Tasmania. And uh, both of those were to be important. I'm sure there are others yet to be identified. Um, the Wilds Manufacturing Company had been electroplaters in Adelaide, um, and they developed steam cookers, which was then taken up by the army, not only the Australian army, but in due course, the Netherlands East Indies Army and others. Um, and they began in the post-war period to produce prefabricated buildings. And later on, they made two attempts to produce an Australian-made car. They were a very innovative company. And here are Wilds buildings being put up in the... Um, uh, shed at Yanyara Station in South Australia, uh, uh, and Adelaide, sort of the, the, the maker's plate from Yanyara Station, and the building's being put up in Adelaide. Um, I don't know of any complete intact Wilds building surviving, but it's a very interesting development. The other person who um, came to maturity during the war was John Payne, who um, established timber prefabrication works in Hobart um, in 1946. And he went on till about 1950, or he failed. Another legacy of the war was the manufacturing capacity of munitions factories and other wartime installations. And they had a number of important um, uses. This is one of them. The Victoria and Interstate Airways Limited system, VIA system, was a complete prefabrication system after the war, used in some cases for houses, but most of all for uses like post offices. Um, and they didn't seem to have made a great headway after the 1950s. They continued, I think, mainly as a system for office partitions rather than complete buildings. But most interesting of all is the Beaufort House, um, produced by the Beaufort Division, which had manufactured uh, aircraft uh, and was made entirely of steel. Um, here's the uh, brochure for the first Beaufort House, steel house, um, and a prototype was put up in the Treasury Gardens in Melbourne. Here it is being assembled um, and uh, surrounded by all sorts of controversy, union issues uh, and uh, council approval issues and so on. Um, and um, in the end, the whole project wound down, but not before significant numbers of these houses were, were produced. Um, but the most interesting aspect was this. 
Samuel Goldblum, a returned serviceman, walked into the Housing Commission offices and lodged an official notice that he wanted to occupy the Beaufort House on display in the Treasury Gardens, Melbourne, because there was a provision then that vacant buildings could be occupied by ex-servicemen at a reasonable rent. Um, and this is interesting because it's the sort of thing that is being discussed today. Should people be allowed to keep vacant buildings? It's a real policy issue. In the end, he was evaded, evaded by the commission claiming it was Commonwealth property and the provision didn't apply uh, to him. This is the second Beaufort House here, which lasted even a less time than the first one. And here's one of the surviving uh, ones in Pasco Vale. There are a number surviving in, in various places. And this is Tony Isaacson's slide. He's here today. The great rival of the Beaufort House was the Meyer House, which I won't go to, into in much detail. But the Meyer House um, had been a pet project of Norman Meyer of the Meyer Emporium. He then got in uh, cahoots with ANSET to, to manufacture prototypes. And in the end, full-scale manufacture began by the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation, um, which was actually a private body, despite its name, a syndicate of um, private people. Um, and these two systems, the Meyer and the Beaufort, were subject to great political um, controversy. The Beaufort was founded by the left wing and the Meyer by the right wing. And Robert Hamilton, who was an architect and member of parliament and member of the Liberal Party, promoted the Meyer House. Um, in the end, of course, both were wound up. The Beaufort in particular was wound up because the amount of steel it used at a time when steel was very short. The Meyer House used significant amounts of steel, but was mainly made of, of, other, of other material. And then also from the uh, manufacturing capacity of the war, uh, another munitions factory, the Hauser Commission took over or leased the Holmesglen factory uh, and then transferred into it the system of uh, precast concrete, which they had acquired from Thomas Fowler's estate. And they made large numbers of uh, prefabricated concrete buildings in this factory. Now, I want to just mention the two bodies, the Council for Scientific Industrial Research and the Commonwealth Experimental Building Station, um, which were the most innovative developers of prefabrication. Um, they purchased um, uh, a number of overseas houses, British houses, four of them, uh, and built them at Ryde, uh, New South Wales, in 1946. But I want to make one important point about this. Nobody thought at this stage they would be importing European houses, British or other European houses. They brought these houses out as examples from which the local industry might be able to learn. Um, not, as, not with the idea that they would be themselves important. And then various uh, models were developed. So the CEBS developed the Steel House of 1947. The CSIR, CSIR developed the Penalised Timber House in the same year. And then there were a series of trips overseas, which were to be significant. Um, Isaacs, who was the, uh, the director of the uh, CEBS, uh, went to... Uh, United Kingdom, Europe, and USA in 1947, and his senior technical officer, Drysdale, followed shortly afterwards. Um, uh, and they discovered uh, many interesting examples of prefabrication and other uh, examples of building technology. This is from their, their report. And then other government activities in the post-war period um, were the Agricultural Bank of Tasmania, which was one of the first to make houses locally, um, and then there was the, uh, or I should mention, um, um, uh, Best Overend, who was uh, an architect associated with the Housing Commission, returned from service and proposed the Indus House, which is a timber house, which never got into full production. Uh, and there are a couple of others that I'll just mention. This is the Commonwealth's proposal for a steel house in 1945, which, as far as I know, didn't ever really get into, into operation. This is the Tasmanian government housing of 1947 being assembled. And that's the, that's the result. And this is the Housing Commission of Victoria moving houses around. You see they're in sections large enough to fit on a truck. I don't know which particular model this is. The Housing Commission of Victoria was the first to really build hundreds of prefabricated houses and import soon afterwards hundreds of others from, from overseas. And then this is a mysterious proposal, the ALFAB, from the National Building Directors in 1952, which, as I understand, it was not a proposal that they would build and sell these structures, but a model for other manufacturers to take up um, and, uh, and make such buildings. Not so much houses as you see here, but 
uh, sort of warehouse and industrial buildings. And there were many other manufacturers, many, most of whom have not been researched. This is one of interest to me. Um, these are, there are a number of these houses at Tumut in New South Wales, which are made of steel. Um, and they seem to be made by the Snowy Mountains Authority. A name appears as tried to help me find the source, but you can't really prove um, who made them exactly when, but it looks as though they were made at Cooma by the Snowy Mountains Authority. They are made in two parts, so they can be moved by truck. Uh, the smaller part on the left contains the laundry and bathroom and so on, and the main living areas on the right, and they were linked by what was an open link at first, but later on they've all been enclosed. And if you've been to a uh, winter at Tumut, you'll know why they were all enclosed. Um, but they used massive amount of steel, not just in the cladding and so on, but the steel stairs, and each were provided with a steel garage, which is a detail. So at a time when steel was so short that the Beaufort house had to be aborted, these were using steel in unnecessary quantities. I mean, to building a single garage, you might as well use timber, but this had plate steel and ripple iron in the, in the doors. And that's, I think, what proves it's made by the Snowy Mountains Authority, which being a major engineering enterprise, would not have been restricted in its, uh, its use of steel. Um, and this is just one example of what goes on with government bodies later on, right up to 1957, the Hunter District Water Board, many bodies like water authorities and so on, uh, made their own housing for their own, for their own staff. Now I want to turn to some private initiatives, non-government initiatives, um, the first of them being the Triton House, which began as a rudimentary sort of structure, this would say accommodate two workers on your farm or something of the sort, um, and they seem to have begun perhaps around about the time of the end of the war. We don't know exactly when they began. But they went on to develop into the ordinary housing market um, with these um, systems of moving on these transporters, um, complete walls. And by and large, at first, they supplied the components for a local builder to put together. They weren't the contractors for the whole structure. And then they began producing quite regular houses. And this is another of Tony Lee's Discovery is one of these houses. And here's the house as built. And in the end, by 1975, they've become sort of major project sort of builders. So that's the history from the small shed-like structure through to this grand sort of country ranch style uh, dwelling in 30 years. Morrison Brothers was a smaller operation in Melbourne. Um, and here's this proposal in 1947, again, a Tony Lee discovery. And there's the house, or one of them, as built. And McDonald Constructions and Dandenong is their works, bringing a building out of the works on the uh, low loader. And here's um, a blueprint for the McDonald house, and an example at the bottom. And then the Archon system was rather strange. The Archon system seems to have developed out of one of these um, British prototypes that have been imported. Um, and I don't find examples of Archon anywhere much, except in Perth, and this is an investment in Western Australia for Archon structures, but again, not houses so much as industrial structures. And then a more stylish one here is the Wonderlick um, house, of which I know nothing at all, 1957. Now, apart from these industrial uh, enterprises, a number of individual architects propose their own schemes of interest. Here's Walter Bunning, proposing a concrete house. And here's Marshall Clifton, Miss in Australia, proposing a house for the Kimberley, prefabricated hut, he calls it. And most interesting of all is this one, which actually got built in London, um, designed by John Knockridge, the Melbourne architect in association with uh, uh, English architect C.A.B. Smith. Again, it doesn't seem to have gone into production, but it was a fully uh, aluminium clad house of great interest. And when you look at it, here's a plan and details of it. Um, under the floor, it has these sort of ant cap systems. It's all designed for Australian uh, conditions. Uh, why? In it's London? Uh, well, I mean, there are a number of proposals being developed in England at the time. I don't know how Mockridge got his foot in the door with this particular one, but there were aluminium houses being built by Hawksley in Bristol and so on. It was in the spirit of the time, which was sort of, you know. And I don't expect you to read this slide, but it's my list of local builders. Prefabricators in Australia, just to give you an idea of the number 
uh, and that's of course only the section I've been able to find. There are huge numbers of prefabricators operating in Australia in the period 1945 to 1955. And Robin Boyd uh, pricked the balloon somewhat. Now I need to explain for interstate viewers here uh, that nothing in Victoria is true unless Robin Boyd said it. That's why we keep on referring to Robin Boyd. Um, so prefabrication is a term used too glibly, uh, but the point is he's making is that it's used, it uses the local makers use local materials and equipment, and they don't really increase the housing market. What do they, what, what do they achieve? Not very much. Um, so some of them improved in style, some marginal improvement in efficiency, but making buildings locally does not really solve the housing problem. So the first overseas ventures then are, arise. Um, I don't want to spend time on Operation Snail because I would be treading on Philip's toes, but I need to mention it because it's the first attempt by uh, an Australian um, uh, state government instrumentality to import houses for its own um, employees. Um, Operation Snail was designed to provide houses for the Victorian railways, and they uh, the team went overseas and um, interviewed all these uh, companies. And I want to just mention that the Redifice Construction Company, Five Down, is one which will appear later on, and so will um, some of the others, like A.W. Hawksley, the aluminium builders at the bottom of the, of the list. They produced houses, as I say, for the Victorian Railway uh, employees, and then also for the... Uh, uh, water employees as well. There's one of them in Kyneton. Now, the spin-off of this, which interests me most, is the Riley Newsom House, because um, Newsom had been, or Riley had been um, rejected by the Operation Snail um, interviewers, and he was angry, and he got up, got together with the uh, Newsom body, and they created their own house for Australia, uh, using largely Scandinavian timbers, uh, here's their system, and there's the uh, kitchen core. But look especially at the system on the left. There are panels, boarded panels, fitting together. And they are doing the same thing, as I showed you before, uh, the Ormals system from Sweden. Um, and as these this company imported its timber from Sweden, some of it from Ormals, which is a sawmill and prefabricator, uh, it looks as though they were actually taking over the Ormals technology into the Riley Newsom house. And there's one being put up. You can see the panel being assembled there, which would have a spline between it and the next one. That's in Canberra. These ones in Canberra put up by, by A.B. Jennings. The Mustard Hut is a rather mysterious one. This is a British example, steel structure. They're mostly used uh, in Tasmania, the largest quantity of them, uh, for school classrooms. And I wouldn't have mentioned it today, except that I now find that one Mustard House was advertised in Perth, so it was being used for housing as well. There's um, a, a surviving mustard building in Tasmania discovered by John Matthews with its uh, maker's plate on it. So these were London makers of steel clad uh, buildings. Now I want to turn to the uh, state house. I don't know what Dennis is doing there. Anyway, it's an importation by <laughs> the state housing authority. I want to quickly survey what the state housing authorities did by way of importation. It's a, it's a really arbitrary and sort of cursory look at some of it, but here's the um, Victorian Housing Commission, and you see their first ventures were not all that successful. Um, the Sagmeister, Austrian houses, uh, were in default, the whole contract collapsed, and so were the German Raster houses at the bottom. The Thermo houses were more successful, and numbers of those were built, and you can see them today in their hundreds as you go into Geelong from the, from the north side. And then the next year, 1950, they imported houses from Holland, from Piemann. Piemann's was the, perhaps the best of the overseas prefabricators, the most reliable of them, uh, and others from Germany and Switzerland and, and from uh, France. There are the sorts of houses they built uh, by the various uh, makers, the French company at the top, the Austrian company at the, uh, uh, at the bottom. New South Wales also used thermo houses from Austria, um, uh, and um, also engaged Sagmeister of, of Austria, who then didn't perform very well, and they imported a aluminium uh, house from uh, Hawkesley's in, in England. There's their thermo house being put up, the prototype being put up at Normanhurst in Sydney in 1949. 
And there's the Hawksley House. Now, I'm not mentioning Hawksley and Bristol very much because they made mostly school buildings and other buildings like post offices, not all that many houses. And in any case, Andrew Seneca's paper will be dealing with some of that boomer, so I don't want to spend time on them uh, here. Queensland was quite adventurous, engaging with uh, a Swedish company, a French company, an Italian company, uh, Legname Passotti, which will be mentioned again in Norman, uh, uh, Norman's paper, um, as a supplier for the Snowy Mountains Authority. Uh, and uh, you can see again, they got into trouble. Two of these people reneged on their contracts, and there are big legal actions in Queensland about them, these houses. Western Australia, I know very little about, um, but very interestingly, um, these Austrian buildings, which probably were by Thermobar, we, nobody ever mentioned who actually made them, but they were put up on this estate, Hilton Garden in Fremantle, which is a lovely garden city sort of plan, uh, and they're interspersed with locally built houses designed by Marshall Clifton. It's interesting that sort of garden city planning had more or less died during the war in most cases. Um, in Melbourne, some of the housing commission estates designed by Frank Heath uh, did some of this sort of thing, but they were not the house, housing estates for the imported houses, they were for the local houses. This is the only case I know of where an attempt was made to make an interesting urban environment for the uh, imported prefabricated houses. And there are some of them surviving today. Although they've been altered, they, you can make out pretty much what they were like, not only in view, but in their, their plans. So these are houses by an unknown Austrian manufacturer, probably Thermo or Sagmeister, uh, put up at Hilton Garden in Fremantle. South Australian Housing Trust, I'm doing a little trick on you here. Um, these three companies are all more or less prefabricators or people who are held themselves out to be prefabricators. But what they did in South Australia was not, was not that. They attempted to, to immigrate. They attempted to bring their business to South Australia and settle. So um, I know you were asking me, if you wanted to emigrate to Australia, why do you go to South Australia? Well, I hope that Julie Collins' paper will answer that question. But that's the fact that for some reason, uh, companies that wanted to emigrate to Australia went to South Australia in particular, more than elsewhere. And when you look at the Orlet, the middle name, the Orlet Timber Houses, there, it's quite unlike the Orlet construction in, in Britain. That's where Orlet construction was in Britain, a precast concrete system of some sophistication. So they just used their neighbor's excuse to get out to Australia. Then there are these authorities of importance, not unlike the Victorian railways with the Operation Snail. The Surrey Mountains Authority brought out a number of buildings, and again, I don't want to tread on Noma and Lara's paper, um, but there are some of them, um, including the uh, Legname Passotti ones uh, at the bottom. Now, with the Mendes government, there came a change in approach. Um, a number of um, things were done. The Labour government had been suspicious of prefabrication. Um, in particular, of course, the idea was that by importing buildings, you'd be taking jobs away from local workers. That was the unsaid um, um, sort of aspect of it. Uh, Nelson Lemon, who was a very enlightened housing minister in the Labour government, was dubious about the benefits of prefabrication and didn't really uh, give it his full approval. He approved buildings for government employees and the military and so on, but um, uh, not the general housing market. Although, of course, the general housing market was really the responsibility of the state government anyway, but the federal government could control the import restrictions and tariffs and so on. Uh, and only the amenities government took it on themselves to really try to hasten importation from, uh, from overseas. And again, Robin Boyd comments, they're now going to import buildings from Europe. The part of the world which is most affected by war has to be summoned to help us again. Um, so you've got Europe bombed out, devastated countries, uh, wanting to rebuild, and they're sending buildings to Australia, which has masses of timber, you'd think enough workers and so on. Uh, it doesn't seem to make at first sight much sense. Well, the main reason was that the European countries were desperately in need of foreign exchange. And in particular, um, Britain had a, I can find the figure here, um, we had a credit, Australia had a credit with Britain of something like $4 billion. Now we think of Australia as um, coming to the aid, Brit aid Britain during the war as a sort of patriotic way. In fact, we screwed the British thoroughly, we had a huge credit, and they had to sell anything they could to, um, to, you know, to retrieve this uh, situation. And so the Mendes government sent this mission overseas uh, to investigate, once again, the sources, possible European sources of um, 
of, of prefabricated houses. And you notice there the third one down is Christopher Van Dyke of the Van Dyke Brothers prefabricators, with whom I mentioned right at the beginning. They are still major players in the prefabrication field. And that's my list of overseas prefabricators whose work came to Australia. Once again, don't try to read it, but just marvel at the number of them. Now, some issues of logistics ar arise here. Almost immediately, when houses began to be imported, they found they hadn't got the labour to put them up. And then almost, almost immediately, deals were done uh, to bring out workers with the houses to put them up. Um, uh, and sometimes um, they sent out uh, sort of uh, executive people to oversee the construction, uh, but sometimes the whole uh, working team was, was, was brought out. Um, then they began to realise the workers themselves needed houses. So often the houses came with the workers in part of the, some of these contracts. Then they found that Australia, the local authorities, couldn't keep up with the pipes and wires and roads. So they began to enter contracts with overseas suppliers to supply the houses and the labour and contract for the drainage and road making and so on. It seems mad, mad that you have to go to someone in Europe to contract to make your roads and pipes for your new housing estate, but that was actually done. Um, and then in the end, some of these overseas companies began to manufacture in Australia itself. Now, what sense does that make? You'd think if you can manufacture in Australia, why aren't Australian companies doing it? But it happened. Um, I want to turn again to some of these types. Tony Lee, once again, has found this one. This is a FIBA house from Germany, about which I know nothing at all, but he's found the uh, the blueprint, or black print in this case, of the manufacturer and the surviving house in Warrandyte, Victoria. And then this is the Redifus. I'm not trying to pronounce it in Italian because it's actually in English name, it's a combination of Reddy and Edifice uh, from Milan. Now, I mentioned before, Redifice is one of those companies um, interviewed by Operation Snail, but not successful. But they began to export privately through the private market. And this builder, Edwards in Adelaide, um, was uh, planning to put them, live in one and put them up. And uh, you see here the most luxurious type of prefab. Um, there it is in view. Um, as the uh, Australian Home Beautiful said, not very prepossessing externally, but very smart internally. Um, with devices like this, this is the folding down dining table, uh, parquet floors, uh, mosaic floors in the bathroom at home. And then the Scandinavia. Um, now, Sweden had been the one country in the world which most of all relied upon prefabrication in its local market from the late 18th century. So it's the best equipped country to export as well, and it and it did. And these are examples here. Now, once again, I don't want to tread on Scott Robertson's toes. He'd be speaking about the bottom company, Olmos Sagwerk Atibalag, um, which is the Olmos sawmill company of Sweden. Um, but uh, they sent numbers of buildings out. This is the first illustration I have, and I don't know which Swedish company it was, but it was a proposal for houses in Australia. This is the Olmos company's Australian prototype. They built you see a bunch of snow rather than likely like location at their factory in Sweden before sending them out. And here's, I just want to mention these houses, again, not treading on Scott's toes too much, but because these houses built for the Royal Navy um, at uh, George's Heights, Sydney, had again, very smart interior detailing. Look at the door handle on the, on the right hand side. I just contrast that because those great estates of houses built by the Victorian Housing Commission, uh, mainly near Geelong, were full of asbestos cement. And I've never heard of anybody going through a program to replace it. So I imagine there are 2,000 houses outside Geelong still full of asbestos cement, which is going to kill somebody uh, in due course. Luckily, it's only the working classes, so it doesn't actually matter. <coughs> so um, what is interesting about the Swedish company is they then set up a local company. Ormar Constructions was an attempt, Ormar was an attempt to make a English speakers pronounce something like the name of the uh, company in Swedish. Uh, and they began manufacturing in Melbourne. Um, uh, as I mentioned, this is the, the next stage of relying on overseas people to do your do your work for it. Um, and they um, entered a contract with um, uh, the Tasmanian government, or well, they tended the Tasmanian government to supply, I think, something like 500 houses. And the press report said they tended to have been accepted. And they arranged a party uh, in Melbourne, which included inviting the Tasmanian shadow minister for housing and so on, before the Tasmanian government reneged. And all of us was left with no contract at all. But this is one of the houses they apparently built uh, in Melbourne, 
uh, for the private market. Again, a Tony Lee discovery. Um, and um, they were drawn entirely in Sweden, but are made uh, locally. And I want to conclude by turning to the one group of migrants who brought their own individual houses with them. And the reason this happened seems to have been that in 1952, uh, 51, I think, the Australian government did a migration uh, agreement with the Dutch government and migrants came out freely to Australia. Um, and so you have people bringing out their own houses. This one in uh, Shepparton. Um, this one in Merigam, these are both Victoria. Uh, this house had been their family's holiday house, which was originally prefabricated, but they took it apart and brought it to Australia. And this one in Tasmania, the De Jong house, which was later on bought by the, the Brigginshaw family and Josephine Brigginshaw. Is Josephine here? I've never met her. Yes, Josephine Brigginshaw is the daughter, has been researching this house. So once again, I don't want to uh, exploit her work too much, but I'll just show you. That's the catalog illustration of this uh, house type used in, in Tasmania. That's where I'll stop. It varies enormously. Um, as I say, around Geelong, the Housing Commission, the Victoria Houses, they're all there. I mean, you hardly any of it has been demolished. Um, Tony would know more about Tony Lee, would know more about the suburban houses because they individuals spotted around the place. I think there's been greater losses of those. Um, uh, Natika, who's here, has just told me there are numbers of Maya houses surviving in the uh, Shara Brimbank. Um, but I, I can't give a general answer. I'm sorry, I just really don't know. Well, uh, I'm sorry, checking down the back. The, uh, the ones in uh, the Heidelberg West, the uh, prefab, they still built by, I think, the Jennings. They still exist in our uh, Fitch West, too, and I think there's a lot in Ash Burton, and I still recommend still one of the greatest ones I've seen. Which, who, who made them? Heidelberg West. But who made them? <coughs> they Heidelberg West. Are they the concrete ones? Or? Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, of course, numbers of the concrete houses. Oh, the Housing Commission survived, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not so much the high-rise flats. I mean, the no. concrete house project evolved from having single houses to doing walk-up blocks of flats to blocks which are sort of seven or eight stories high with a bridge so you could go to the middle level to the full towers, which are now sort of notorious in Melbourne and now about to be demolished by the state government. Yes, sir. Um, just a comment um, in regard to the Beaufort houses. I think there's it's a little bit of a furphy that it was because they used too much steel. I was going through all the Commonwealth um, files recently and uh, researching them, and it seems to be more they they spent a lot of time proving that they weren't using too much steel. But then there was a change in state government, um, and the new state government was very um, was supportive of the um, I suppose the upset of the local builders who were not being asked to put up these buildings. So it was only. Commonwealth workers coming in, putting the houses into place. No private labor was being used. And that was um, perhaps a bigger factor in the fact that um, they discontinued all the contracts. So I'll send you that. I'm not sure I could all that, but as far as the seal is concerned, there's a lot of complexity about that. In the Beaufort House, for a time, it was thought that it was using, I think it was claimed, enough steel, um, the steel belonging to seven other houses, something like that. So every Beaufort House stopped the market building in seven ordinary houses. Um, then somebody said that the gauge of steel was different. In fact, you were, if you use the right steel, you were saving money. It didn't make any sense at all. But in the end, I think it's true that the steel shortage was what you could the Beaufort House. Um, now, as to the unions, interesting enough, the unions at first opposed these imports. And in the case of the, um, uh, of the Operation Snail Houses, they were what was imported in the end by the, was, was pre-cut rather than prefabricated. So the local work would be put into it. Most of those I've been talking about are prefabricated houses in the fullest sense. Later on, the president of the Australian Council of Trade Unions was actually advocating the importation of houses because, of course, the unions also wanted housing for their members. So they changed their, their tank. Yes. Daniel, uh, I'm really interested in your point about uh, credit and foreign exchange um, mm -hmm. with the UK. How do you think it works with the other European countries? Does, uh, does Australia also... Um, they, they didn't have a formal 
credit as far as I know, but all their countries were in deficit, that's in general trade terms. The French in particular wanted to import wool and they wanted to import the wool by sending houses to Australia, for example. Well, I had a question about the um, number of prefabricators, those lists are quite remarkable locally and internationally. And yet around 1955, things seem to tail off. What, why is that? My interpretation is the housing crisis had largely resolved itself by then. Right. To me, the period 45 to 55 is the, the critical period. Right. I mean, Van Dyke Brothers wound up in 55, and a lot of companies just stopped. Right. And the imports mostly were only a couple of years. And so you don't think it was um, a natural recovery after wartime restrictions? Um, and I, I just don't quite understand why there's this reversion to local traditional forms of construction. Well, I, I was saying I think it's A, because that crisis had been largely sorted out. But as you say, of course, the restrictions were gradually lifted on the ceiling heights and so on. You could build bigger houses and also the materials became more available. But you know as much as me about that. I think the, the reason why it died out is that it wasn't economically and technically necessary once the crisis. You know, you've got end of the end of the Second World War, lots of people needing houses, lack of labour initially, the demand, the technical progression. I mean, it's, it's a confluence of of things in a line. And what we see now is prefabrication doesn't necessarily offer you either an affordable or a technically advantageous solution. Yeah, that's really saying the same thing the other way around. I mean, prefabrication is intrinsically not economic. There has to be a reason, particular reason for it. Once the market normalizes, why do it? Georgia. Yes, Mark. You mentioned about aluminium and the involvement of the aeronautical industry. Uh, to what extent is that a failed attempt to use aluminium? Aluminium not only as cladding, but also as a structural material. I think you showed us an example where the entire structure was in aluminium. Yeah, oh yes, no, uh, the Bristol classrooms and the Hawksley buildings, um, of which there are thousands brought to Australia, but as I say, mostly non-residential, so I've not really discussed them. They're all aluminium. It's a major issue. Uh, the other thing we, we raise is the, the technology of war was the idea of stress skin construction, where uh, as airplanes were clad in surface which they contributed to the strength, stress skin plywood construction was introduced in America, especially in the Gunnison house, and it became a standard for um, for plywood houses, and it was also used in these metal houses, aluminium houses as well. So the World War and uh, the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation, were they instrumental in... Uh... In using aluminium in the construction industry, no, it's just the British makers who used it. Very little was used, it was actually made in Australia. Because those examples you showed before from aeronautical conference, they were still using steel and timber, which were not necessarily the, the, the key materials. So I didn't catch that one. Uh, show some examples from Bullport and the Commonwealth yes. uh, Corporation, but it seems to me that we're using timber and uh steel as a primary structural material so in essence they were they were creating a new branch uh, as an industry yes the construction industry. the Beaufort house used almost all steel the the uh, Meyer Ansett Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation house used sawing amounts of steel plus uh, cement sheeting and various other materials timber and so on yeah no no, no. Well, I was interested with the uh, Reddit, Redifice or the Reddit feature. Redifice? No, it's not the Reddit feature, uh, no. Uh, were any of them built? Well, apparently, um, this South Australian builder, Edwards, um, well, the report comes at the time he's building it. So it's, it's how it seems to have got to Australia and presumably it was built. Whether he managed to sell any is not apparent. Well, oh, thank you. Uh, Incredible amount of detail on it is really fascinating. Um, I wonder, um, you know, the, the government seemed to not have been very effective at trying to sort of direct this, but I mean, were you know, government policies around the funding of housing, um, sort of you know, how were these houses funded? How did people buy them? How did people occupy them? I mean, and, and how and is government policy effective there? 
Well, the great majority were public housing. This is those imported by the various housing commissions, which, of course, had different policies as to whether they let them or later on generally made them available for sale. Um, the interesting houses tend to be the much smaller numbers of individual houses like the Ridifus and so on um, of, a high, of a high quality. Um, now, the policies varied enormously. Um, I should stress that the Victorian Housing Commission, before it imported these houses, was making huge numbers itself. They engaged G.A. Winwood as builders who made houses at, uh, I think, um, right in Wilson, because in a large scale. Uh, and uh, they made uh, the McFeelands at Marybury, various other local makers were all involved. So that was a big issue for the public housing. Um, but private housing, well, they were bought in the normal way. I mean, there are, uh, Tony Lee's found record of people writing to the local council saying, I've just imported this you know, house from Germany, whatever it is. Uh, and I want to build it. I'm going to use two labourers, and I'm getting you know, all, give all this detail as to how they're going to get it built. I, I wonder, Miles, just to, to reflect on the current situation with housing, which you um, told us is, it doesn't look like it's going to be yeah. um, resolved soon. Is there are there any lessons we can learn from you know the situation post war period? Uh, any uh, ideas that you have that we could take from this period and and uh, usefully revive to, to 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 you know policy issues which we could revive to address uh, the contemporary well, problem. My view is, as a historian, I'm much better operating in hindsight than foresight. Um, <laughs> but I did mention that idea of not letting people keep vacant houses. Of course, is relevant today the present discussion. But beyond that, I wouldn't like to uh, to go. Yeah. Now, Miles, through you, I'm going to ask Tony Lee a question. Tony, um, Miles mentioned that uh, you could import a house to the private citizen, and I'm, I'm, I find it remarkable. Uh, you could buy a house from Austria and have it delivered. Is that right? No, but you, but you can do that. Well, <laughs> well, you had a you had a letter by somebody saying he has to get to use housing commission employees at the weekends to build a house, oh, the house which he'd imported. He explained the whole thing, but oh. all those Dutch houses I finished up with, they were imported individually by imported Dutch migrants. Individually. Yeah, yeah, yes. I think I came across the press article that the Dutch migrants uh, bring his own house with them. Uh, yeah, uh, that's kind of model migrants. <laughs> 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 Um, Miles, a, a question, um, and then Peter raised it with me before the session began. Uh, if we talk about uh, protection or uh, heritage protection, these houses built by the, prefabricated locally by the Housing Commission, imported by many agencies, do you think there's a case for keeping some of them as a sort of memory of, of this particular time? Uh, of course I do. I mean, you really want to get precincts where there's a little bit together to give an impression of what a housing estate was like and so on. But um, even the high-rise blocks, which are marginal to this issue, I think we need to keep at least one because they were unique in the world, almost unique. And I know we have some very practices in the room, but do you have a view? Um, oh, I'd like yeah. to add to that no. so before people start um, coming in. I'm very supportive of um, protection of prefabricated houses. The area where I start getting a little bit uncomfortable is the ones that I feel um, might be of a quality that um, are very hard to preserve. And I, I'm sure it's burning out here on wet houses. So you see it, Operation Snail Houses today, which I understood from stock wood. And I think there's probably some that are more, much more sturdy, the concrete ones, the metal ones. Um, and then I'm not very certain about the timber ones and how many of them do we, you know, forcibly retain look um, in the heritage of them. So that, but that was my thinking of yeah. But David and then Scott. Yeah. Um, well, I'll answer the question I had for myself. Why did I see so many of them in not just snail houses in railway houses? Mm -hmm. Um, and particularly in Green Bank. Uh, Mary Beck, uh, Maribyrnong, et cetera, et cetera. And we tried to preserve a whole row of them in Melbourneston along the railway line, and the uh, council wouldn't have it. They saw the uh, opportunities for people to buy a cheap house and redevelop it. Uh, mm -hmm. So the snail houses. Yeah. 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 
Oh, yeah. 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 Are there uh, any um, to what you were uh, saying? There's um, examples of um, cottages built actually during World War II uh, called Duration Cottages, mm -hmm. uh, tiny, tiny buildings, uh, especially cement cladding, um, and they're only meant to last for World War II, and that's it. Uh, they're still there. Uh, in country towns in New South Wales, this go Orange and Bathurst are good examples, and the ones in Orange and Bathurst are now uh, actually listed uh, as separately uh, heritage sites. So they still get used. I think the answer to all this is that if the buildings still have um, a viable use, uh, they can be kept, is, is quite the intention mm -hmm. with a uh, built to be something that you throw away when the walk has some wings and built. I should, didn't mention, I can just chip in there, the Lithgow houses were built for munitions workers. Uh, were duration houses built by Van Dyke Brothers. They turned to their normal prefabrication to constructing these duration houses. This guy, yeah. Yes, thank you. An observation, Mark. Yeah. You talked about prefab houses primarily with um, pre-cut houses are probably much more difficult to locate. Mm. But I have noticed here in Melbourne, many of the timber supply companies working in the suburbs of Spring by Italy and Ocean places like that. That was a longer term sort of development because from the beginning of the century, um, Saxton's mills and so on were all making pre cut houses, but it was really very uninteresting technically. I mean, they've cut the timber the right length, you want to send them timber window frames, and you know, that was it, it was an ordinary building, really. Nigel. Where does the ubiquitous um, World War II army have fit in this sort of kind of thing that we're all familiar with? Um, I mean, where that is. Well, um, I, I can't really answer that. I mean, as I said, the Australian Army didn't use the Nissan huts, so they used huts like those army huts. Uh, and I don't know how many there were or some, but there certainly were not much used for housing purposes. There were some, and Camp Pearl was full of them. more to do with further with the first quarter of the 21st century. Why do you think that basically developers who have a, a real bad reputation of basically building complete nonsense and rubbish are going to basically turn around and build something that's quite right? This young lady here basically turned around and said exactly what I was thinking, right? We're now in a situation where basically the builders are basically doing every centimetre they basically can. They're cutting back on materials. The materials are basically complete, some of them are complete rubbish. Why do you think that basically all these people will basically just ch change their, their way of thinking and, do, and build wonderful structures or even portable wonderful structures in this environment? Can I answer that? Yeah. With my apologies. No, no, no. It, it probably has to do with the scale of operation. Yeah, well, people are building. Houses probably much larger than they need with materials oh, no, yeah, and yeah. with a, a built in obsolescence, which many of these houses had, yeah. um, but they're building larger um, in a way for less, right? Given that, that they'll, they won't last very long. So. But my, my question is basically relevant to that. Yeah. We live in a time where basically every centimeter, as far as buildings and development, is going to be absolutely valued, right? Yeah. So, they're going to start cutting costs. They're going to start cutting production from that. As much as we sort of turn around and say, no, no, hang on, this is wonderful. We're going to do this. We have to do this. All the architectures in this class now. They're the ones that are going to get the brief is what we're dealing with. We have to consistently, constantly deal with the brief. That's the price. 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 Well, I've got a, a, a question. You gave a fantastic overview of prefabrication in Australia uh, pre, during, and post uh, World War II. And it seemed that activity was quite extraordinary. Was Australia unusual? So were we unusual uh, compared to, say, New Zealand or Canada in terms of the embrace of prefabrication? I don't think so. Uh, certainly, uh, the United States were doing it massively. 
the big step in the United States was the Tennessee Valley Authority, which produced hundreds of houses. And then in the 1930s onwards, there were numerous developments, the Strand Steel House and various other steel houses, um, steel frame houses using pressed steel studs rather than timber. Uh, and there were um, numerous um, sort of the trailer homes. The beginning of the trailer home really is 1930s onwards. Um, very big in, in, in the United States. I don't know so much about Canada. Canada had a lot early history of prefabrication across the railways, across the, the prairies. Um, that's from the early part of the century. It just, it just continued, I think, timber houses. I, I can't really speak for other places. Oh, look, one thing I should have said, no American houses came here. Remarkably, they did join the gold rushes. So they didn't come here in this phase. No houses from Europe went to America, as far as they can make out. Although all these missions took the uh, United States in on their trips, they really was totally it was just junk it. They have no relevance to the whole issue. Uh, and, uh, I was just wondering, were they just not putting American houses perhaps too expensive? There was, there was oh, for here, I guess yeah. so, yes, yes. There wasn't that foreign exchange issue. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I was just wondering to what extent were all those things and pictures part of the package um, and bathroom things? And yeah, nearly all. Um, Australian inspectors often went to the factories and approved the system. The problem was not the fittings there, it came as a matter of course, store handles and so on. The problem was things like plumbing, where it wasn't going to conform with the local regulations. So somebody went over there and said, oh, well, adjust that and the board of works will approve that sort of thing. But the store handles and things pretty much, you know, part of the prefabrication package as a matter of course. Oh, maybe. Oh, no, I'll, 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 yeah, surely. Um, I'm Miles. Actually. Hey, Uh, well, I think the whole portable tarsum issue developed from the Hawkes in Bristol tarsum, which came out in huge numbers to Australia um, from 1947 onwards. Um, and very early on, attempts were made to make local ones. I don't know how the overlap took place. It was a, a continuum, certainly, yes. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. So questions online are from um, yes. an anonymous participant. Can Miles clarify why he thinks prefab is not economic? Does he mean it was not then because it's mainly imported or is generally not? Generally not. I and mean, there has to be a reason why it becomes economic because of the labour market or the materials, something of that sort. It usually involves uh, more refined construction, more finer margins and so on, uh, often more expensive components that you need to for the fixings. Uh, it just is a, what do you save? I mean, anything you can save on a prefab, you can save in a conventional building, but not the reverse. Right. Um, the second question is a, a comment to us. Can we prove the audio of the questioners? Yes. So, yeah, yeah. So, so please, please, if you have a question, uh, can you share? Um, uh, because those listening online are having trouble. Mm -hmm. And the third um, and final question is from, I think it's Simon Scully. Uh, I'm interested, and Simon would be in the Northern Territory online. I'm interested in the comment that prefabrication was not cost effective over time and that the industry players folded. As the ratio between labor cost and material cost change, are we now at a tipping point? I don't know about now, but the general issue is if you have cheaper labor in the place of origin, then there's a case for prefabrication. In Australia, it depends upon whether you are importing the materials anyway, because if you're importing materials anyway, it's happened in the 1850s. Most of the houses in the towns were built of you know, Baltic timber and so on, not Australian timber. Once you're importing the timber anyway, and the labor is cheaper at the other end, that's a very strong case for importing because you don't want to carry waste material it's better to you know prefabricate the house rather than carry all the stuff and saw it off and throw it away when it gets there uh, and have it done by the cheaper labor but in the first world war ii period it's much harder to to generalize about that i think 